This is going to be another episode of the Best Damn League Show period. Obviously, that is not Dom, as I always say at the beginning. He was on the one. He was on the last one actually. And this time, it's not even the other people who aren't Dom. It's not Zabatine. It's not Jensen Gore. Because what I thought I'd do is. Obviously, it is cool to have some of those people back. But actually, one thing I've liked about this series is because it's, there's so many things happening week to week to week, I like to get some fresh eyes. So if people don't know, Memento here is a player who actually was in the LEC. He was a jungler. You probably maybe know him when he was on Schalke at one point in time. And before that, I mean, I'll give I'll give the brief rap. Basically, he was an up-and-coming jungler. He made his name on Rock Hat. Actually, it was one of the bad Rock Hats. That's actually why people gave him a lot of credit. It looked like he was kind of carrying them. Then he went to Schalke with Dylan Falco. And the problem is, it's kind of a tragedy. Split started so well, then it dropped off. Basically, whether true or not, People scapegoated Memento here. He was replaced. I mean, to be fair, he was replaced by like Trick, who was like an MVP of the LEC and had won the championship. And then basically beyond that, he played for a number of years more up until last year. He was in other smaller leagues, ERLs, etc. And now he is coaching Nord Esports, right? Was that a fair Memento? I don't think I was too, too un unreasonable with that. Uh, no, no, I think that's pretty fair. Uh, it is true. I did uh, play in the LEC and then I did get benched by Trick uh, back then. And I, I think I was uh, scapegoated. But it's so long in the past. Yes. And it's uh, kind of my bad because I'm not really a public figure. No, no. Not you know, you never tried to speak out against it. I think the only time no. you ever spoke out was you sort of implied like you did have some sort of like issue. Like I think if people don't know, I'm guessing you maybe had some nerve issues in the games or something, right? Uh, no, I mean, do you want to go over it real quick? Yeah, just briefly. Yeah, just give me your thoughts. Minutes. Yeah. Um, no, so I think for me, I always played like in these rocket teams, uh, giants. But basically, what I would say is like, it's kind of like loser's mentality where everyone is used to just losing. So you get this, like, you learn how to cope with it. So when you lose, it's almost expected. So you kind of have this, like, positive mindset. Your teammates are nice. And it's kind of like, let's give our best uh, for the next games. And let's continue grinding. Guys, sure. it's OK. You get the pat <laughs> on the back. And those are the teammates that I was used to, because I played, like, in Giants. Uh, I did play with Schalke, and we qualified. Uh, that was when I played with Upset. Uh, then in Schalke, what really hit me hard was I was in a team with, like, full winner's mindset. There was like Odowamne, there was Upset, there was Abedage. I mean, Abedage was like a rookie. He was kind of, he was really whatever back then. And the thing is, I never actually were in that kind of team environment where everyone didn't give a shit about your feelings or give, didn't give a shit about like, you, if you perform bad, everyone just flames you and they try to replace you. That's it. But I was used to like back in the day. So it was like, if you play bad, then your teammate comes to you and he's like, all right, let's see, you can do this. Well, let's look for a solution and stuff. And that pressure just uh, kind of hit me way too hard. And I was not ready for it, honestly. And looking back at it now, I just think I was too immature and not used to that kind of like winning mentality mindset. Now, there were some like, I was treated a bit uh, unfairly, but eh, it's all right. That's at least my conclusion for it. No, no. By the way, the reason I also said you escape good. Look, I'm sure if I go back, there'll be some mistakes in the games. But there's two things. Yeah. One is the problem is the step up here was crazy too. Like you say, Rockout was never ever supposed to win ever. So if you ever did anything good, it was like, yeah, hey, that's not bad. Whereas yeah. the problem here is people might know Schalke was at this position where they thought they were contending for worlds at this point in time from this kind of a run. So and those players you just listed, some of those people have been to the top or some of the best players. So they got they expect that. Like they won't tolerate anything less. And this is before the yeah. days where people. People had subs in and out. So at the time, people just ruthlessly cut. Like if they thought they had to cut, you just ruthlessly get cut. And then the rep, the Reddit narrative follows you, etc. Yeah, I know what you mean. But if people are wondering why he's on this episode, it's because he actually does do. He actually is one of the few people who's a pro. I notice he watches the games and tweets about them. And actually, I've noticed you have pretty good analysis, mate. Like you just, I've noticed you don't, you don't, you don't really do. I mean, you're Swedish. You don't really do a very like sort of flame style. You're doing sort of more like, you know, even keeled level headed. And I'll spy also thought that pair really well with me because spoiler I'll bring all the flame for two of us don't worry about it so let's yeah. get into LEC shall we because everyone's yeah. trashing this region at the moment Memento saying all the games are bad and the level's low and all that and look I agree to some degree but mm. at the same time one thing I'll say is this there have been, like, for example, when we get into this one here, like, that Fnatic Vitality series, there were some bangers. There's some, there's some exciting games. There's, yeah. um, listen, even when they're bad, like, I mean, her ex Fnatic, there's some games there where the team that loses could win. Like, as much as, yeah, we can flame it, if we're in the bubble of EU, we've got to look at the best players, the best teams, and see what they're doing. So I'll tell you where we'll start. Let's just start. Obviously, we watch all the series. Let's start with Team mm. Heretics, because, mate, this is a team where, on past episodes, I, I always said I've had to reserve so much sort of, like, hope for 
this team because even though they have like what happened this series was perfect the way it played out same with, with the SK Gaming series what they'll do with this team is they'll give you like a game and a half of a series where you're like they're pretty good actually yeah. you know what like the Zeros had the globe like sometimes they can team fight even like drafts are alright sometimes they'll get in these games but they'll all what they seem to do is they always betray you in like one big game there's always like a game on the fine point there and they, they blow it somewhere what have you thought of this squad because I know it's been a bit of a mess with the roster but like I say I actually think the thing is if we're going to accept that everyone except G2 isn't that good I actually think the pack below them is way closer than people seem to realize like, there is a world here where SK could have beaten Heretics but maybe Heretics could have beaten Fnatic and and then Vitality could have been, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's so yeah, many yeah. sort of this peaks. So what have you thought of Heretics? No, I mean, Heretics, honestly, to me, I just think they're a team that lacks a lot of firepower. Even changing, like, perks, I don't think he necessarily played that bad. I think perks, like, last year, we have a lot of, like, criticism, which was valid. He had a, like, pretty bad year overall. Yes. But this year, I think he was actually performing quite well, and it looked like he was actually back in his form. They had, like, a lot of good wins in the early season, uh, but going back to winter. And then the whole off-season drama happened where he gets benched and they bring in Zviro. But uh, to me, I think Zviro has been like a really pleasant surprise. Yeah. Like if we watch the uh, Team Heretics versus Fnatic series, uh, that guy was like the only guy actually performing and looking yes. like he wants to win. And he's taking responsibility in the games as well. He's not one of those, you know, we see this a lot with like rookies coming in and they're like, oh shit, I don't want to die. I don't want to look bad. Yeah. So I'm just going to farm. No, th this guy is- he's, Oh, he's gone like, in on I, some of the Azir shuffles, hasn't he? He's gone like yeah, fully yeah. in. Yeah, I agree. But also, check, can I swear on the Yes, of course. I'm going to do it loads, yeah, don't yeah. worry. Yeah, okay, perfect. <laughs> but he's just fucking caring. Like, uh, absolutely. Like, everyone else is just... I hate these rookies when they come in. I think we saw it, like, last year. I don't want to shit talk too many pro players, right? Sure. But we see, like, when Blue was in SK or when these kind of rookies, when they come in, the only objective they have is almost like, I'm going to try to look as good as possible so I can get an offer for next year. Yes. But when Zwyro comes in, he's a rookie, right? But I think he's been ready for, like, maybe the past two years. And he's coming in and he's actually looking hella good. Like in the series in Team Heretics versus Fnatic, he was like this shining light of Team Heretics. And honestly, like the first game when I look at Fnatic, and one thing I will say, like uh, regarding how much hate there is towards the EU region, which I think is fair, but let's be fair as well, because we watched like Damon versus Gen G, five game series where we have like Pace flashing, flashing in, like ulting in with Kaisa, then he flashes out like perfectly, Rakan, and Cannon comes in and does like a perfect kick. And then you go like to Team Heretics versus Fnatic. Of course, Fnatic. of course. Like Razor, Razor does a level three gank mid, dies under turret. And then like Wonder has Bami, Cinder goes under turret and dies. And then after that, they like contest Herald and then they just die as well. And it's just like the level, if we didn't watch, like let's say we didn't watch the LCK, we would be like, oh, LCK is looking good. Actually. Yeah. It's normal True. mistakes. Like that's all good. But the mistakes that are happening in the LEC are just so basic. It's like things that we discovered yes. five years ago. You know, like, let's not take a number disadvantage fight. Yes. Let's not fight when we're behind an item. We're out like, the package, all that shit. Item. Yeah, of course, everything, yes. Super simple yes. stuff. And that's why the hate is, like, really yes. coming. I think it is a bandwagon, of course. Like, of course. people want to farm likes on Twitter. And, of course, like, it's famous to hate on EU, so everyone's going to do it. But I, I had given up on hope, like, on the LEC actually contesting internationally until I saw the G2 series. But I'll stick on the Team Heretics and Fnatic for now. But in that series, like, Fnatic as a team they have no idea how to lose a game slowly. And this is a trend I keep seeing with them. Because even in the Team Heretic series, like, Razork does that really int gank on mid, he dies, right? But they actually recover quite nicely. And Razork finds, like, really good angles on bot lane afterwards, and they actually come back in their game, the game e state is even. And then you see Oscarini, like, go for a proxy when he knows that Jarvan is topside, and he just gives a kill, and it's like, what is happening? And even though... Like, Humanoid uh, was able to actually get ahead and get some free kills. He had a 700 goal shutdown, which he gave to Zviro afterwards. Oh, sure. The game state is fine. It's like, it's yes. even. It's like, it's okay, guys. We can still win. And then they're like, you know what? We have to double down and go. They always force the it, don't they? they all, yes. You know what they, I get the vibe about is this. The story goes, like everyone knows that G2 wins all the scrims as well as all the official games, yeah. right? Everyone, everyone else thinks Fnatic should be the obvious contender, right? But dude, I get the feeling, no joke, like now they almost like play just like it's a scrim in the LEC game. Like this is what you do in a scrim. You just go like, fuck it, just keep yeah. going. Because you can go next always, can't you? But I, because if you think about it, right, the problem Fnatic has without going too far from the Rex thing, because we're talking directly mm. in this series here, is mate, this is why all these series are always close. On the last episode, I actually said about Fnatic, my real fear is this. I do think 
think they're probably the only team that can beat G2, but I don't know if they're going to get there. Like, I even did predict, I thought they're going to get wrecked by BDS, but I think just tactically, that's the perfect team to sort of wait and catch the throw, if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. back back on the Herx thing, though. Yeah. I would just say this. I definitely agree on the Zviru one. I actually thought in the split, this is why narratives on Reddit are so powerful. In the split, everyone was doing that thing where it's like, he's way better than Perks. It's like, is he? Like in the split, it looked like actually he was doing more like you were saying, like a rookie. His job almost yeah. was like, don't die. In other words, don't be Perks and then don't get the blame. And then what happened was, I allowed the team to look pretty decent. Like they had some more at macro late in the game. They could fight sometimes. Obviously they have the players to do that. The problem is, in the playoffs, he has had the globe. Like, even when people are going to say, yeah, but most yeah. of the games are on Azir. Mate, I'm watching Nuclear Int, who's been in the LEC years now, play Azir every game, and he isn't doing this stuff. He's playing way more concerned. He's not doing... I agree with you, mate. That's the other thing. You could yeah. play Azir or a mage and be a pussy and just fucking hide and use it to get out and always just dodge it. He's he's doing those sick moves. Like, look, he isn't Chovy, but he, he does, like... He tries his own version. He'll go, like, right in the back of the fight with the fucking... The, I love that when people do that. And for a rookie, I agree with you. You can tell, yeah. for real, this guy was waiting but he was waiting the way a pro, a pro should wait for your chance and when they give you your chance mate forget all that shit of like secure your salary just, just go for it it's the playoffs mate just go for it and I have to say I agree with you he's one of the main reasons they almost they could really have been like fourth or third like the moon knows but they, they could have been much further in the playoffs for me yeah no for sure I think so too I mean Team Heretics had a lot of like potential I would say but if you look back at it, like even versus the SK series, it wasn't a clean series. It was like Niski actually ulting into the, I think that yes. was the famous Corky, you know. Almost and every game like, he was dying first blood or something, mate. it was yeah. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't like the team heretics were like outsmarting them, no, no. playing better. In late. No, I mean, SK were just inting. And that's another story about SK, but they're out of playoffs, so no one cares right now. Sure. But uh, team heretics, like when Jankos is actually on his form and he looks good, yeah. then the team looks good. And Zvairi is doing his job and he's actually... Playing really well. I even thought like Wonder was actually having quite a good split. I think most of his like, he, he seemed like he was coming back to his old form. I wouldn't say like his full old no, form, no. but he was looking good. But the issue I have with them as well is this like lack of firepower. I think yes. like Flacked, right? You think about him. I see him on like 5 0 Zeri. I'm not thinking like, oh, this guy is gonna completely take <laughs> yes. over the game. He's gonna like yes. flash in 1v3 quadra kill like Noah does, you know, when he's playing Zeri. I think like, oh, Flacked 5 0. That's nice. He's going to be stable. He's going to be good, which is not bad. But it's like the lack of that firepower of that, like being able to team fight out to maneuver your yes. uh, opponents. That's just what they seem to be lacking. And I also don't want to say like, I mean, Trimby on Renato did not also look that good. I think he's much better on like some engaged champion. And I think they really need that. But going back to it, I think Jankos had a very under, uh, underwhelming series versus Fnatic and was kind of one of the key series why they weren't able to actually yes. win versus them. I think like first game he was doing fine, even though Razork was like the one actually running it down, even from the level three, like on mid. But Jankos wasn't even shining in that way. And the second game was like what really hits me when I see Jankos do play like Mauke, he's going like blue, wolves, red buff, and he's just like two levels down or like a level down on Razork the entire game. And Razork's just finding these like angles the entire game. And then, I mean, if we can go also to game three, then yeah. I think it was just a complete jungle diff where Razork does first the bot lane gank, like lane gank successfully. And then he goes top and dives to wonder in front of Jankos when he's at Krugs. And it's just, I don't know if this is a trend, but everyone who plays against Razork, they just look completely garbage. And I don't know if, this, if it's like Razork is one of the best junglers for sure. He might even be the best jungler that we have in the region right now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, ultimately, I think it comes down to the two, those two things where, when it comes to team heretics and the lack of firepower and then being out jungled kind of. Yeah, I would say on that one, that's one of those ones where you think to yourself, it's Jan Kost, mate. He's fucking covered yeah. lanes against the best junglers of all time and beating them even sometimes. But I get the vibe for real. There's another guess I'm going to make as someone who's known the pro scene. That also looks to me like Fnatic's just shit on Heretics in a million scrims too. And then he's just been, mm -hmm. Razork's just done the demon mode where you just from minute one just wreck the other guy's jungle and dig every guy. And it makes it look like Jan Kost just went in the game thinking that like, oh, essentially like I can't just play as myself. Because, yeah, I, I thought he was... I agree. Actually, if anything, if you could have told Jankos how Razork was actually going to play, I feel like he'd have just played a way more controlled game, taking less chances, and they'd have caught, caught the throw. But he almost played like he was desperate. He, like, he actually had to do this, like, weird shit. And then I definitely agree on the firepower one. It's an obvious point at this point in time, but the gamble I made when I thought this team could be good when they announced the roster at the beginning of the year mm. was the gamble it is what he's told us all in interviews, guys, which is that Wonder only was weak side in all those years because he had 
the bot lane, didn't he? He either had like uh, fucking Reckless or Perks and Mickey X or he had Upset. If yeah, you have yeah. these players, yeah, you probably should weak side. Actually, you're one of the best hybrid top lanes we've ever had. The problem is we were supposed to believe on this team when Flackett arrives. By the way, probably the best guy to be the weak side ADC and just be that go even bot lane. It's supposed to be yeah. your time, wonder. You're supposed to be like all pro. At least he didn't do that. Like he had good games, I agree with you. But the key thing is he has good games on stuff like a Kisante. You know what I mean? He's not he's not playing like the super carry top. He's not going to be the Jace no, player. No, no. And so I agree with you. When you don't do that, Flackhead, like you say, definitely. If you watch the LPL, the LCK guys, the second I see like Jackie Love on, on two kills or like up a Viper on like a three kill Zeri. I'm like, right, get the popcorn out, mate. Even if they lose this one, he's going fucking ham. He's like, the, he's like Neo in the Matrix now. He can do anything in this game. I agree. If Flackhead gets the kills, you're like, oh, cool. He's actually had this yeah, that's game. that's great. Yeah, but I agree. But once you get to the team the fight, game, like, you, you're actually yeah. putting all the pressure on this VU guy as well. He basically has to carry the team fight at that point in time, right? Yeah, I mean, he has to be the one to step up. And he actually did it. I mean, yeah. in the game two, he was also having a great game. He was like 7-1 on Azir. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the rest of the team was just kind of gapped, honestly. Like, yes. Only Zvira was the only hope uh, of the team. And then, of course, like... He is playing extremely aggressive. He still makes the mistakes in teamfights where he's like getting caught off guard or getting hit by like a CC where he shouldn't be. Uh, but overall, like I really like the mindset and it's really refreshing to see someone try to take some risk and try to actually carry games and not just sit back like we see with other rookies and just try to like hope that things will go well. You know, I have Wonder, I have Yankos. I don't need to do anything. Let me just lift off my hands and see what happens. But it's refreshing. I think it gives a lot of hope for... I mean, I wouldn't say like the full ERL system, but sure. at least for Zviro, I think that that was a good split uh, from him showing. And in the playoffs, we really saw him like pop off. And he oh, shouldn't no, even yeah, be yeah. the one that actually pops off. No, no, of course like, not. He, it's not his responsibility. He shouldn't be the one that like shines. Yes. It should be the rest of the team, but he, he was the one shining. So. I'll even add this in. I give him extra props, mate, because he's starting in spring split. Like, even other rookies had the winter split to sort of charge up and get going. Yeah. He has to just come in immediately, perform. If he didn't, by the way, they've got perks on the bench. Maybe they bring him back. Like, the pressure's big if you're this guy, but I think he's lived up to it. I agree. And I also do think, whether or not he's on this team next year, I'm pretty sure another team takes a gamble on him. If I'm like an XL or something, why wouldn't I potentially consider this guy as talent? And then I'd also yeah, say, sure. we haven't mentioned it except for the champion pool there, but obviously this is one of those series, by the way, where don't even bother opening the Reddit thread. It's just a bandwagon of like 500 comments about like, Trippy on Alistair, and that's all they say, bro. They don't even analyze, oh, yeah. they don't analyze what he did. What I, like, first of all, guys, Alistair, by definition, you're just going in, and if, it, if it's not the right angle, you're getting fucked. Like, <laughs> it's not like you have like a fucking a dash to get out after that. You've gone in, like, you, and also, look, mm. I do think actually he did in that Alistair game, obviously, but it wasn't yeah. already him. I'm with you. Yankos wasn't playing well, by the way, jungle fucking support is the synergy guys also mate, Flackhead had time. there was one moment in the series where he just walked me like <laughs> just to get wrecked like what it's not like Trimby mind controlled me to do that so I agree yeah. Trimby definitely had a bad one there but my issue here is this if he wasn't added to this team, they're not even at this point. Like, this team was pretty bad. I think them adding him did open up things like his champion pool, changes what you can do with the draft. I do think it changed the bot lane dynamic. Definitely, if you if taken out perks, yeah. you have to add shot calling, guys. Like if, you might not think perks is good with your eye test. I, this guy's one of the best shot callers ever. Like, he definitely knows what he wants to do, what to call to make. Whereas, actually, if people don't know, if you've ever heard the comms, the Yankos style yeah. of shot calling is more like the question. It's like, can we do this? Like, should I come here now? It's like, that's not the same as being the guy of, like, we're doing this or, like group now, like let's fight now. Yes, yes, and re-engage, you know. So I, mm. I, I can essentially, I'll take the odd Trimby in game because that wasn't what made them not make top four this tournament, guys. Like there was no, other no, things no. before. I mean, they could have won these series clean if they wanted. I agree with you. The other problem, if you're heretics, is even though we're saying you could have done all this, in a way, you sort of deserve to lose here, though, because like I said, you could have lost SK too. Like you, you just played so messy the whole time. It's just the sad thing is, even though there are positives to take. I just actually feel like, I want to ask you this, bearing in mind, now we've got the MSI break, and in theory, it's hard because it costs money, but in theory, you could still make one roster move if you're this team. You could bring someone in. The tricky thing is, though, mate, I feel like, even though I agree, I would just make, listen, it's, you have to, it's going to be a hard cut. Whoever you cut, you have to cut All someone right. and gamble on some talent, probably an ERL talent, but you have to hope you get a carry. The problem is, who the fuck do you cut, though? That's the hard part now, right? Who would you cut? Yeah. I mean, that, that's the thing. I don't think there are many potential, like, 
players that you could take that would actually upgrade the roster? Like, who do you actually replace? Are you going to replace Wonder? I mean, not really. Who other top laners are there? As Viral was already doing good, I think you keep that guy. Yeah. And then if you want to look at, like, AD carry replacements, I mean, I don't even know if there's any, like, decent AD carry that's a free agent. Yeah, the problem all, is it's also free agent. Like, out. if anyone's going to go, just get, like, crown shots. Like, that's not going to be free. BDS isn't just I mean, going to give yeah. him Yume for free. So it'd have to be someone like... Is, is Neon even play? You know what I mean? It'd have to be someone like that, wouldn't it? And yeah. they're usually on ERL teams, you know. But do you really want to have like Crown Shot in that team if you think about it? Like you have Trimby already being a leader shot caller. You have Crown Shot also being known for being a shot caller. And then we have Yankos and then you have Wonder. Like, sure. I, I think that's just going to be a complete fiesta. Yes. Like, they need someone like just silent who shuts the, well, is quiet and just performs. Like he is, you use your hands and we'll take care of the rest because they have smart players. They're able yes. to play the game. And going back on like Trimby, yes, okay, his Alistar game, people are just looking at his last moment, which was when he W'd Cause. the Zach into his team. And then they're like, holy shit, this guy is so boosted. But it's like, uh, guys, he actually like got them all this way. Like, did you see how Heretics were playing last split? Like, did you see how much he did yes. the entire split? But that's the thing about esports, it's like, people will only remember your last possible Cause. moment. And then they will make the entire, like, painting... They rewrite the... the back, so it was always like that. History yeah. becomes whatever the last moment was, isn't it? So it would be like, oh, should we sign Trimpia? No, but didn't he W Alistar? Like, didn't he W the Zach into his team? And now that guy's terrible. And then they just move on, like, we don't sign this guy. But it's like, yes. no, that guy's really fucking great. And he, he's done a shit ton for his team. Yes. So, yeah, I still think he's a great player. I mean, okay, they all have int moments. but No, yeah. of course. Right, okay, that's Heretics. We can move past that. Let's do, yeah. let's get the Mad Lions out of the way. So I'll just do the obvious part at the beginning, which is people think I'm going to do what I've done in past episodes, which is because when all of us in the scene predicted Mad Lions not to be that good, and then they went all the way mm. to the finals. Look, shout out BDS mention, fucking Adam. But okay, still happened. They still go to the final. By the way, I'll even give them credit in the final, way more competitive than I thought they'd be. They actually won yeah. one game. They could have won some of the others with, with some of the G2 wins. But with that said, to me, it was obvious you could never maintain that level of form because if you did then I'd have to give props actually to the org of Mad Lions because what they have done is found the greatest crop of rookies of all time and mate that didn't happen like first of all Think of the players they brought in who were the rookies. Almost everyone yeah. in their own way had like a globe or looked better than he expected. Like obviously the Merwin guy last split was like, holy fuck, who is this guy? Like, and he can yeah. play all these off meta picks. I'll t Wonder said this on, I think EU Fari or something, but I, it's, it's, sadly it's when a veteran can just see things you can't see, guys. When he said this, it made me realize, oh fuck, he's right, isn't he? Which is mm. the Merwin guy isn't bad. He's all right. Like he can play Cassandra or something like that. He can play some of the meta picks. But the issue is, He's way better on these weird picks. But the thing about the weird picks is, because they're weird picks, it's not solo queue, guys. You can't just pick that champion. You have to make it work in a comp. So the problem you get sometimes is, sometimes he's not even trying to be a front line. And it's like he's on all these, he's on like the fucking the TF. And the, and that looks cool when you carry the game with it, mate. Or the, when he was doing Varus last split. Yeah, when you yeah. do that, it looks cool. First of all, it hasn't worked. And also he just played way worse this split. Then you think of the other player. The other player I was hyping was the Alvaro guy. Mate. I know, sadly, everyone's got distracted by this stupid thing where the super guy thinks he is fucking like Viper or something. I don't know why that is, but I just want to tell him, bro, you're not even the best in your lane. The Alvaro guy was the truth last play. He looked fucking amazing. Well, I'll tell you what, when they're unable to just play through bot and accelerate every game, he doesn't look as sick anymore. He doesn't have the same agency anymore. And then for a Scovy guy, I gave him props last split because in the playoffs, he had a globe. He had some matches where he did sort of like clutch it out. And when he was like, hey, actually, I didn't think this guy was any good. I have yeah. to say, the people I know from the RLs, that was one of the players they told me, like, I don't think he's going to be that good in LEC. He'll be all right, maybe, you know. So the issue is, when you come back down to it, they haven't got that much left. Like, a lot of what was making it work in the last split was either individual globe or they were, like, looked so cohesive mm. as a team. Mate, a lot of those things of, like, mid-game, like, what does this team have? Like, I think they've, they, they ended as a mess for me, mate. I'm actually not going to make it even that harsh. They just ended as a mess. Like, they didn't build on what happened last split. What have you thought of Mad Lions? No, okay, so I actually have quite a theory Come about on. like these r rookie rosters uh, all the time because I've seen it happen multiple times now, like especially with even SK because now it's like confirmed for me because last winter as well, SK does great. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, the, the, when SK first playoffs. came in, yes. Yeah, and I feel like this is a very important thing about like rookies coming in is that Mad Lions comes in with four new rookies that no one has any data on. Like they don't know what they play. Like Alvaro and uh, Supa, right? They were known because I played against them last year and they're a very good bot lane, but they're also very good at like fake pressuring. You know, they'll walk up even though the jungler like is in, uh, I don't know, in on red buff when they're red side right and like on the other side of the map. And the thing that happens with these rookies is that like in winter split, they're really good because the enemy team doesn't have any data on them. Like they don't know how they actually play. So when they're walking up to you, 
and there is, you're like, holy shit, they probably have the jungle behind them or they have a TP or something. So you respect automatically because you are not aware of how they actually play the game. And I think this is something that actually brings a lot of success to the rookie lineups in the beginning. And Mervin as well, like, he pulls out a fiddlesticks top. Like, who yeah. can expect that, right? True, like, true. Doctor, and you're like, holy shit. Dude. And, but once a split comes down, right? Then you start actually seeing like, oh, okay, by the way, he can play these kind of cheese picks. He will play this in this situation. Okay, we're prepared for that. But like, of course, in winter, when no one has any data on how yes. these guys play and how they're actually, what their champion pulled is, then of course, they're going to be caught off guard and it's going to bring them some success. Like, there's not to take any credit from them because I think they were playing really well yeah, yeah. Like, back in winter. Yeah, but I also think every other team was extremely bad at the same time. Yes. And... Uh, now we come into the spring split, and I said, Merv Mervin said this in the interview too. He was like, yeah, people kind of know now that how we play, and they also know our cheese picks. And it's not a, as big of a surprise. Like G2 as well, when they, I think it was G2 that knocked them out. But I just remember them playing the Ori top, uh, if you remember. Like Mervin played Ori top, but they were like, yeah, we expected it. We knew that he would play it. Oh, that was Vitality, my bad. Yeah, but uh, Vitality, they were like, yeah, we expected it. We just thought that it would be AD. Like, now everyone knows exactly what he can pull out. Yeah. So it's not a big surprise. And also their gameplay, like playing through bot every single game. It's like, okay, let's just look to match them and let's draft a yeah. good bot lane. So you kind of like, once the more data you get on the enemy team, the easier it will be to play versus them. Yes. And that's where the veterancy comes in. And like, have you actually, like Spring Split is more about, have you actually improved? And have you found a way to play the game that is consistent enough to actually become top three, top four? But Mad Lion's way of playing was not consistent enough to actually become a top tier team. Like they relied a lot on these like cheese picks, making like Super Alvaro actually having star performances. And they played really well, but at the end of the day, it's like not enough to actually be a contender. And they just have to go back like into summer right now. They have to go back and just redraw everything and try to like figure out an actual playstyle that will consistently work for them and something that they can repeat basically. Yeah, I, I would yeah. say it this way as well, because the same happens in Counter-Strike, the game I'm native analyst in, which is you get the players and the teams that suddenly do the jump up in level and they're like getting upsets and maybe there's a map they're really good on that you think, wow, they're even beating world class. And what happens is this, fans think, oh, they're just not hitting their shots anymore. They're not, they're not winning the same duels. It's like, no, no, what you don't know is the other in-game leader, the equivalent of the shot caller in league mm. and the coach... They now know, right, this person's a threat. Put them on the fucking whiteboard. We're going to study them now. And you have to understand, yeah. guys, these coaches are literally the best in the world at breaking the game down. Like, the reason why Mad Lions was always going to be in trouble is they're going to have to now go af after a, a big amount of VODs of LEC games and scrims against them, against Peter Dunn, Mark and Pad, like the... Dylan Falco, like, these guys aren't fucking around, guys. These are the best analysts in the world. That's why they're paid the big box. That's why they're able to... Have you noticed how they're able to take their rosters and level up after a bad split? Mad Lions mm. just dropped off after the split, and some of that's both factors. It's not just that they did badly. It's also that their edge is getting taken away, and then, by the way, if you ever get any individual drop in form, it's going to look bad. Like, it's going to look dodgy. And by the way, I want to get your thought on the super take. Look, obviously, mm. he's going to be memed forever for stupidly saying he's the best ADC in the world or whatever the fuck. Yeah. Like. But this was actually another example of why I don't believe in the player, unfortunately, because mate, even when he has, the, like, like we said, a flaccid thing, when he has the lead, I don't expect, like, when I watch an LPL game, like, oh, fuck, right, watch out, this AD is going to take over the game, you're going to group with him, you're going to win the object, no, no, I, I can't trust him with the lead, I, like, I, I don't know in the mid game if he's mm. going to be able to get the kills, if he's going to be able to skill the fight, I just don't really get, like, maybe you know more about him because you were in the same level of the scene, yeah. Is, it, is he really just a super confident guy? Why do you think he made that remark about being the best? Like, it's, it's, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's strange to me. To me, it sounds like he's just a very confidence-driven player. And he kind of needs to glow himself up and feel that confidence and able to play as confidently in-game. And I think that remark is like, either he's just memeing, which I hope he is, because it's kind of like a wild statement to make when bonk, you play the it? one split <laughs> and then be like, I'm the best by far. It's like some fucking forgiven shit. It is, is. yeah. Like, is he legit just forgiven back in there? Like, he just took over his soul. But it's, it's like, I think the guy is good. Like, he's definitely good. He's had a good performance for a rookie, like coming into winter. And he's like, I think this guy, how many pentacles has he gotten? But he, he's like, looked really yeah, good. But at the sure. same time... <laughs> Mad Lions are only playing for bot most of the games. They're always looking to like set them up. Like I, I remember the game when they played versus G2 in the finals and it was the, like game three and he has like Varus is like 7-0 and they were just not able to actually team fight around him and they just ended up losing. And he's like 7-0 and his whole team is like, they're just praying for him. Like it's a fucking super El Gaib and they, they are like all flashing in front of the CC and they play it perfectly, but he still just dies and gets caught out. 
And it's like, yes, you can definitely feel that you're like the best AD carry in the league when everyone is kind of playing for you. Now, I do think he's really good, but he's definitely not like the best AD carry right now in the league. I think that's actually Karzy, dude. Or yeah, the Koreans yeah. that are coming in. Like, yeah. Yeah. Right, go on then. We'll move on. I agree. We, we can yeah. move past those teams. So let's do Vitality next, obviously. Right, mate, this is another mm. team where... <sighs> Like, I want to tell them within context, like, yeah, not a bad split, you know. You're in these games. You could have gone further. But the reason why that's such a bomber to me, and I want to get your take on this first, is I actually low-key think, now that Hillisang doesn't int, this, I get why this roster was made. I actually, before Winter did yeah. hype them, I thought they were going to be like fourth best team in the LEC or something, right? The, the reason I hyped them was I looked and I was like, mate, I know the Photon guys cracked. Again, I don't follow the Reddit narrative. So when I was watching that Vitality team collapse the year before with Perks and Upset and that, the Photon yeah. guy, it was never that he was bad guys. It's more like he was just, I, I always thought he just looked like he was in solo queue. He was just really good top lane, but he, he couldn't connect to the team. And I, I don't think people played for him quite frankly. I think he's mega talented. So I think he's a stud still. I don't think he did anything wrong here. You look at the, the bottle now sorted because I agree with you Cars he's cracked yeah. mate you know what's no one talks in G2 games about Hans Sama now like he's not really having to be the super carry at this point in time Caps carries half the game so I actually think Cars yeah. is fucking really good and then you go and look at the rest of the team Vethio's pretty good now he's even evolved a little bit the obvious problem and I want to get your take as a jungler is this yeah, there's yeah. another player who's not had much time in Daglas but it's making it look like, because these other names, we know what they've done in the past. They've been elite players. They've played well. So it's making it look like he's he's either bad or he isn't right for this team. What, what is your sense for this player? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the sense I have too, to be honest. Like, I think Douglas as a player is good. And that's like, but that's it. He's just good. But it doesn't seem like he has his own idea of how to actually play jungle. A lot of the things that he's doing, like even in the series... Uh, where the play versus Fnatic, where he's doing like level three dive mid, level three gank mid. And he could have actually just, if he was adapting in the game, he would easily just look to deny Razork instead or invade him. But to me, it seems like when I'm watching uh, Vitality play, it's like everyone tells him exactly what he needs to do. Hey, look, you're going right. to play Bolivar, you're going to do three camps, and you're going to gank mid. And if you do anything else, you know, and uh, he, he just seems not the right fit for the team. And I think this is something that I was talking about before as well when I was uh, making a video on Hillisang. And I was showcasing Hillisang is actually the key player of that team. And he's carrying their like really bad jungle mid synergy and jungle soup synergy. And Hillisang is actually the only one who is actually trying to you know salvage that. And I think when I was looking at the team before as well, I knew that they were going to run it down like in this in the winter season. Because when you play with a player like Hilosang, like you have to learn how to play with him. Sure. Because he's going to play his own way, like no matter what. Yes. Like you have to adapt to him. And now when we come into spring, it looks like people are actually getting, no, uh, getting to know Hilosang. They're like, oh, he goes for this all the time. All right, I guess we just have to follow. But there are like so many situations where Douglas will be like on the other side of the map when they're making a top lane dive play. And uh, Hilosang is like always there in the right position, but his jungler is like one step behind. And one thing I haven't seen like with Douglas and Viteo is like, I haven't seen them many times actually just go through mid, push out the wave, and then just move together. It's always like Hillisang being there and then leading the play and making them go there. And when you watch Douglas play, it just seems like he's being kind of micromanaged by Hillisang or Karzi and they're just telling him like, hey, yeah, come bot here. No, no, let's go top. And he's just kind of like following into it. But uh, there's nothing to take away from Douglas. I do think he's like a good player overall, but it's just not, that's all he is uh, for now. Just he's a good player, he proved, but that's it. And he was kind of saved by playing well, like most of yes. his games. It was like he was playing well, like I don't know how many games, but there's like m many, many until they started banning it first. And, but uh, yeah, I think someone like, I think you guys talked about it too, but like if you have Bo on that team, like Bo we Hillisang, like, I, would, I would pay to see that. Like yes. Bo and Hillisang both on the same team, like these two guys just, they, they could actually be a contender for like being top one or contesting G2, I think. And yes. I think Karzi Hillisang, like, this split, they honestly, to me, they look like the best bot lane in Europe right now. And uh, I, would have, I, I was so sad when I see them lost. But I kind of expected it because I just think, like, them having such a poor mid-jungle synergy and sub-jungle synergy is just going to hurt them in the long run. Like, the better teams you play versus, it's going to be, like, much more of a weakness. 
This is where I've got, a, I've got a theory for you. And I want to see what you think as someone who played the pro level and has obviously been around the scene and even most recently played last year. It goes like this. I actually think one of the interesting things from watching LEC all these years is you've seen the evolution of how people general manage teams. So in the early mm. days, it basically players made the teams and they just got the player that they think is really good. And back then, yeah. actually, you didn't need as much cohesion. There wasn't as many set players. There wasn't like set ups for objectives in the same way. You sort of just play off skill and you play a bit. Like, it's actually Swedish way that you play Counter-Strike. You play a bit loosey you just let the stars do what the stars do and if you have expect mm. and so as they basically win the game for you and do all the genius moves and you just do whatever right as we've evolved and we've gotten teams that can play together and could team fight and then they could side lane and they could do the objective control I feel like in the modern day the, the area I think GMs lack because I agree with you by the way almost none of the players we're talking about mm. are like should just be out of LEC. It's not like, right, you just can't play this level. You're fired, no, no, get good. out, leave. They could all, in theory, be on a team. And some of them, by the way, could even be on much better teams. All their teams would be much better if they swapped. And sometimes, yeah. this is the key point, you could even swap. Sometimes, actually, you could even swap some weaker players if they fit what you need onto a team and make some of the squads we're talking about better. So that's the evolution, I think, in general managers is this. Because we have these coaches that are in this position now, people like Peter Dunn, people like Mac, and the reputation is they're genius. They'll find talent and then they'll mold them, right? We've got to stop that mold thing as in you can tweak a player. You can help him like, hey, like, let's like limit a bit of this here. And then like, we're going to use this. You can't take a player though, for example, this is like that conversation about the flackhead one. You can't take flackhead and go flackhead. You know what, mate? You're actually upset. The whole game's going to go for you from now on. You're on hyper carries and we're just going to peel. And in team fights, you're going to fucking pentakill them. Like that's not yeah. molding. That's telling him like, become a different person. Like, he can't do that. And, and that'd be insane to think a coach would have... The, there's no time for that. You don't do it. You'd figure out drafts and scrims and t tell them things from Korean games and stuff. Yeah. That's not even the job. So I think the area we made a mistake is this... I think these GMs are picking players that I can see they've got qualities, but I think the level up needs to be this. You need to look, who are my best players? Because the stars, the good thing about LEC is they're very set. We know how they play. We know what they're the best mm -hmm. at. We know, look at your stars and don't say, is this the best jungler I can recruit now? This is what you say. Is this the right jungler for Vethio? Is this the right jungler to play with Hillasang? If you're on another team, Heretics, yeah. is this the player that's going to mean that then when Wonder Weak sides, it's, we're winning the game because he can't be put behind, he doesn't need any resources. Is this the ADC that's going to... No, I think you need to ask what you needed, not how good the player is and not like this thing of like, well, I'll work with him. Hey, like, because uh, think about how much time you'll be wasting telling like a jungler, for example, who doesn't have like a shot call and mindset and wants to be told what to do. Oh no, you need to yeah. take agency and initiative. Like you can add so many extra, I feel like that's, that's like the hardest route. That's like, that's trying to swim up the stream and go up the waterfall. You want to find a way to go with the current, you know what I mean? With what already is yeah, working yeah, yeah. and flow that. What's your take? No, absolutely. I think just a lot of the rosters that's been put together are just not fitting for each other in that case. Because I think you could take a player like Flakkid and then replace him with Upset. And then Heretics might actually look really good because they need someone to actually lead and they yes. get the firepower that they need, right? But then uh, at the same time, a lot of these like rosters, how they're being made is a lot of times it's very random because it's like, oh, this guy was available. Let's just put him in here. He's uh, the best that we have right now. Let's uh, get him out there. And uh, it just either it's, I don't know if it's the coaches making, I know that it's the GMs making the decisions most of the time. Because a lot of times when I hear other players, they were like, oh, we like when Trimby got replaced out of Fnatic, they were like, oh, we had no idea. Oh, they all like, shocked, yeah. They're like, yeah. oh, okay. I mean, yeah. we had a pretty good season and we made it Worlds. And uh, it's just like, they're just making these decisions for them. And same with when, when Perks got replaced. Yep. And uh, they're just kind of like, oh, our scrims were actually doing pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that's what they said. Replaced. But it's yep. like, <laughs> that's the problem with the rosters that are all being built. There's no like actual cohesive thought behind, will they actually fit? together it's more about like what's available and he was good on on paper let's throw him in here because i just think there there's so many rosters that could actually be good in the lec if we actually get the players that they need yes. together like yes but uh, yeah i think there's uh, that's what's been hurting us for like the past years because i think there are many good players out there but there is not in the right environment yes or, and that's also a skill of a coach like being able to understand what your players need like, you, if you have upset, I would put, like, more dogs around him that would actually yep. follow him and play around bot. Like, I wouldn't put, like, a super carry on top and then a super carry jungler. Like, super carry jungler and upset. Like, if you know what kind of player upset is, since I played with he him He wants the well, dog jungler, doesn't he? he? He wants the dog jungler and he's very, like, he, when he has the dog jungler and people just do what he says, 
then he's really good, right? Like yes. everyone plays towards him. Like you have a Niski in there. Okay, he's always reusing his prior and he's roaming bot. He's helping out upset. Upset becomes the carry. Yes. And that's like perfect. And then you also need people who are willing to go in with upset. Like you had Hillisang upset when they were together. They look great together. But uh, that's the thing. There's just, there's just so, it's, it's a very sad to see that there's not many rosters that are well thought when they put them together yes. in order to like complement each other. Cause that's how a roster is supposed to be. It's like, okay, we have this carry top laner. Let's make sure we get a good jungler that they can skirmish around top side. And then we get like a weak side bot lane because we have a strong top side, but you don't do like a very strong jungler, a strong bot lane and a strong top lane. It's like, okay, uh, who are we playing around guys? And then everyone's also gonna, cause uh, when I was mentioning to you about the uh, like heretics, when you were talking about like, oh, let's get in, wait, who was it? Uh, the player you said, another shot caller. Oh, fuck. Um, uh, Crowny, Crowny, oh, Crown shot, yeah, yeah. Crowny, you said right. And it's like, yeah, Crowny is a really good player, but probably not in that team because Crowny is a very demanding player as well. He needs shot okay. calls and they already have enough voices. So it just becomes like a very chaotic and the, the team doesn't have like a clear play style. And that's why I also think Matt Lyons worked really well. It was really simple. Elioya, you do the shot calling and we're going to play whatever you say. She's like, I want to play both side and they play both side. And it's like, there's no disagreement there. And that was a very well put together yes. roster, honestly. So, yeah, I think a big part about the team being successful is about having players complement each other's strengths and weaknesses in order to actually become good. Yeah, two we're, quick we're things. It. I've definitely referenced to these on past episodes, but I'll reiterate. One of the reasons why I bristle a little bit, like the LAC is trash angle, is because I agree if you just look at the... Like, especially if you watch LCK and LPL guys, they're just not yeah. as clean. They can't pull off some of the players. They can't accelerate like top lane carries like they can in those regions. There's certain things you just can't do, right? But my problem is this. I guess what I bristle at is I think the implication, because a lot of it's NA and LCS fans getting their chance to get back at us and be like, ah, you're trash too. It's like, here's why mm. you're trash in a way we are aren't though, guys. You couldn't mix all your rosters up and make like four amazing rosters that would beat us. The difference is, literally, the LEC right now, I actually think the player talent is very good. I just think that they're like, it's not, they're just mismatched. Like I say, it's like someone took the names and just put them in a hat and drew them up. You just get these five players. No, oh, I've got like three players that work together and two that don't. Like, there's a classic thing in league that used to be the yeah. shot calling concept. It's the same for teams. It's the idea that like, it's better to have five players follow a bad plan than five players players do their own version yes. of a good plan. And that I think that applies to rosters. Like, you can have five good players, but I even think sometimes teams like Fnatic do this. You can have five good players, but if they don't have the same synergy, if they don't have the same idea of the game, and especially yeah, if they yeah. don't have, like... Like, for example, a way to communicate their idea of the game if they're just playing separately. Like I always say about... I'll go back on that one. I, will get, I want to get your take on the Photon guy, mate, because I have to say, yeah. I don't think I'm like an expert about the strategy of the game. I'm not even that good in the draft. I don't play it at the high level. I've never tried that angle. Mm. But I do think I'm good at low and player performance because I've watched a lot of matches of League of Legends in my life. And I have to say, mm. mate, the whole time I've seen this Photon guy play, I don't think he's good, mate. I think he's really fucking good. Like, I actually think for yeah. real, if it doesn't work out in LEC, I think he could go back to LCK and be an LCK man. I think I think they might even take him on a good team. Like he actually looks like he has real talent. Because I'm thinking to myself, he has to be speaking second language English. He's on a team with like mm. a weird environment. I guarantee he's never been in an environment before, by the way, where you have people like flaming each other and shit like that. Like that ain't yeah, the yeah. Korean way. You know, so considering all that, like asked to me, it's I, I, he's somewhat held back in a way. I'm sure he does some of it himself. Like I say, I don't know if he actually I do feel like sometimes he's not on the comms channel when he gas those leads in top lane. Yeah. <laughs> like, it feels like he can't say you'll group around me now or whatever, but what do you think? This guy looks talented to me, mate. I mean, I think he's extremely good and one of the like key reasons why Vatatu was even doing as good as they were doing. Because he, he was the only guy like consistently always getting ahead in his matchup. He plays on, you know, the meme of like Korean Jace. Yep. But when he plays Jace, it looks fucking broken. Like it actually looks good. Yes. But the thing is, the vibe I get when I watch them like play, I think they made an attempt to like play for Photon and like play topside. But it went so bad in scrims that they were like, okay, fuck it. Just leave Photon on his island, let him do his job and let him do well. And that's why we see kind of the Photon that we see today. It's like, he will do really good and he will like do what he has to and try to carry, but they're not going to like fully play towards topside. Like it's going to be around Karzi Hillsign because they know exactly how to actually snowball a lead and they can actually like direct the game in a way where they don't actually need to play around Photon. But I think he's really good and he could definitely be like in a playoffs team in LCK. And uh, I even thought he was like good last year as well even though like they had a completed disaster split. But uh, yeah, I, I really like him. I think he's uh, super good, honestly. No, I'll even give you an example of like a swap just to show what I mean by like, I think he's in the wrong team too. I'll tell you a swap I would do immediately. You can disagree if you want. If I was Heretics and I was Vitality, mate, just swap Wonder for Photon. 
Haven't we just sort of fixed both of our teams? Like, think of the fucking... Now you can play through top side if you're the guys. Flackett's going to play that weak side. Why would you have Kazi if you're going to have a carry top laner? You know what I mean? Like, I agree with you, by the way. Kazi probably the best ADC in, in the West right now. He's fucking sick. And if you actually yeah. load him up resources, I've always said this. What changed my mind on Kazi? It's not just that he wasn't like secretly always amazing and I was just a hater. It's that the game did change in the same way as why Reckless doesn't make sense as an ADC and as a result doesn't even play ADC anymore. Mm. That's why now Kazi does make sense as an ADC. He knows actually that like LPL style of how you play ADC where it isn't like you wait on the edge of the 5v5 team fight, like you kite back on the fucking tank that's coming in on you and then you just get like a pentakill by last click, right click and all the chat. That's not League of Legends yeah. for years now, guys. It really is now like you go in and you have to basically just push it to the fucking limit. You have to redline the car like this and you're almost going off the track and then you're just hoping all your teammates peel, do all the shit, keep the CC off, you're going to flash, dodge, everything. The million spell rotations are coming in. Kazi thrives like that though, right? It's why when Hillasang actually doesn't int, bro, he, they're mm. fucking awesome together because Kazi, Hillasang's going in too. Kazi clearly wants you to go in with him when he goes in like that. Yeah, yeah. I will, I, I have to disagree on like the Come Photon on. and Wonder change. Hit but the reason it. I disagree on it is because Photon is one of the like the extra win condition resources that they have in Vitality. So a lot of games, like you're saying, like Hydrosang will run it down or Karzi will have those like right. 0 14 right. bot lane, you know? And the only reason they're able to even contest in those games is because Photon is doing so well. So if Fair they remove enough. that Photon guy, they put Wonder there. And now Hillsang and Karzi in. And now it's like, uh, Viteo, could you carry please? You know? But now they have <laughs> sure. like Photon who's like, okay, we all inted, but guys, our top lane is really strong. We can still play around them. Right. So I think Photon like really fits the team in the sense that even if Karzi Hillsang will int, like they will still have that guy. Like that guy can still make a difference in okay. the game. And he, he's going to do really well on his counter picks as well. So yeah, that's why. Fair enough. Um, also, by the way, I do think people, I agree with you, people went to, they do this every time with Hillesang. He has had, like in winter, and then obviously last year, uh, no, no, two yeah. years ago when he was in Fnatic, he has had certain splits where he just mega ran it down. Like he just, because his problem is he has no brakes. He will, like even when the car's going off the cliff, his logic is like, well, if I drive faster, maybe I can jump over the cliff. And it's like, <laughs> no, now you're just going faster <laughs> yeah, off yes. the cliff, you know? But the problem is yeah. this, when he turns it around, cause part of his impulse to go for those moves is so unique and is genius. He obviously can be a me mega win condition. So I think most people think he just wasn't shit. Like as the split went on, actually he is one of the reasons why actually this team could do something, why they could contest the best teams. Like as you say, yeah. it, especially with the Douglas component, imagine if instead you'd had like a really conservative support there. I think the Douglas guy would be completely on an island and they just wouldn't even be in these games because the Hillisang yeah. angle will always give you like as much as he can feed, he can also find you a crazy pick or you can start a fight that you, you never could engage otherwise yeah that one as well like he's the one that's actually always starting a fight because he is playing so aggressive he is walking up in enemy team's face he's forcing a fight when they are strong and yes he had a terrible season like in winter right but Hillesang, if you know him as a player we've watched him long enough to understand that like he will have those grief seasons where he will just run it the fuck yes. down and there will be no mercy on his team and the enemy team but then when he actually gets into that form where he gets used to his own team, his team gets used to him and how he plays, then they look like a contender. Like they look really good. And I think Hillsang is like, if they had like more a conservative support, like you say, I think they would just be farming until waiting to lose. And that's what would happen when they are ahead. They'd be like, okay, let's take it down. Let's wait for them to come into us. Now Hillsang is like, we're strong. I'm going to face check everything and I'm going to walk in, follow me or lose the game. It's like, okay, we follow. Hillsang says, and we follow. And that's it. And he's the one who's able to like make the team snowball as fast as they do because of how Hiddlesang plays. But yeah, of course he, I'm not gonna defend him and be his lawyer and say like, oh, oh he's playing not. always good. No, he is a griefer at times, and yeah. that is true. But when he's in form, like when he, now him and Karzi, they look fucking great together. Yes. Like they can play anything in bot lane as well, and they win most of the matchups on bot lane. Like even in the first game that they played versus, uh, I think it was the second game versus Fnatic. Like they were stomping bot and then they were gonna, then they botched the oh, dive and now they're yes. behind it, right? But it's in the first place that it's even possible to die bot. And uh, yeah, I, I, I love Hildesang. I'm a big fan of him. I think he's one of the like, few supports who's actually trying to reinvent the support role and show how useless it is to die. And that's what you should do as a support. You should be starting fights and get your team when you, they are strong. You should be starting any fight and making sure that you can snowball. And that's what he really excels at. 
It's the other reason why when he has the mega bad split, even though when you're watching week to week to week, it feels like he's just done. He's just washed. Get rid of him. The reason why it is so hard to actually kick him is because if you kick him and he goes to another team and then he has the bounce back and it switches to the engagement, (laughs) you are going to feel so fucking stupid. It's a bit like, you remember the story, guys, when everyone Mm. decided Mickey X isn't that good in G2 anymore, is he? Then he went to XL, the team that everyone knew was never, ever a threat. And they were like winning most. They were like second in the league because we're crazy. He was like an MVP candidate. And, everyone, and even G2 were like, fuck, get him back. Get him back immediately. Like the, yeah. it, With a player like that, when the upside is that crazy, unfortunately, you do have to balance that against the downside. You can, this isn't like if a rookie came in and hinted like that, I'd go, well, look, I don't know that you can do anything better. So yeah, replace him, get someone else. I agree. Mm-hmm. I think with Hillisang, you just have to, it's, it, it's, it, it's sweet and sour. Sometimes it's sweet, yeah, yeah. sometimes it's sour. By the way, the cool thing about it as well is I agree with you. You can't only, you can, I guess you're right. I can't play as cynically as I would, where it's like I have the weak side top lane all the time and I just go through bot lane. Because even yeah. in the games Hillisang is winning, he does an isky. He'll just, he'll just throw you, he'll give you, a, he'll give you a chance. It's like he's, a, it's like he's yeah, an yeah, Englishman. He's a nice he'll give you a sporting chance. You know what? I'm winning too much. I think what you have a free shot. Go on. I've, and sometimes yeah, you yeah. get knocked out when that happens in the, in the Hillisang game, you know. <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure. No, but that's why I love to watch him play. I'm really sad that they actually lost. Uh, I think yes. I would have liked to see them at MSI and you'll see they're like chaotic. After seeing the way like, this whole go. series went, mate, I have to mm. say the obvious team for me is I wanted it to be G2 and Vitality. I'm with you. At least there was like mm. some aspect. I mean, by the way, even just like I would vote on uh, the lane, the MSI would be interesting. I think you go head to head with some of those tops. Kazi's really yeah. good. Like, I think you've got players there. The problem with the other teams is like Heretics, I definitely didn't want to go. BDS, I'm so scared they're going to go because I think they're going to get absolutely murked. Like, I think I'll be embarrassing. And then the Fnatic one, well, let's talk a bit about Fnatic then. There's a very good chance yeah. Fnatic can go because here's the thing Fnatic has. The one thing you cannot say about this team is they lack firepower. That's probably the best quality no, no, is firepower, right? And the, their players, this is what's weird. I, I'm not a, a pro, so I could be off on this, but I cynically mm. think when I watch this team, I actually do think the coaching staff's done a really good job with the players that they have. Like, remember, they only changed one player in the off-season, guys. And it's not like the team that went to uh, um, Worlds was contending. They weren't. Like, they could have come top eight, but they would have got milked immediately by anyone. Any other. All those Asian teams were a level above. So when I look mm. at it, you haven't even given them more pieces. What the hard thing about this team is, I feel like it's another team that has synergy issues because I feel like almost everyone individually can be good. I'm not that I'm not that big a Jun fan, but I think the others like Noah definitely has skills. Sometimes he looks a bit hesitant yeah. to me or doesn't know what he's doing. Everyone knows the humanoid Razork thing. It's not that it doesn't work. Like they both have games where they kill everything. It's just they don't look like the people where like. I, I, I put it this way I wonder if these people play duo because they don't look like the ones where it's like they're on the same you know we have the same game plan mm-hmm. like I'm, I'm going to tell you what wave I'm probably going to set up so you can come get. I don't think they do that they feel like they just play they play on instinct almost what do you think of this Fnatic squad yeah okay so first of all I need to talk about like Fnatic's game ones like their game ones look always horrendous like from draft perspective and in gameplay and I think like that first came down to like the Team Heretics one is the most famous one where there were like so many mistakes where everyone was just saying that's when everyone was like railing on EU saying it's total trash etc. Yes. But like that's for to me it looks like Fnatic have that sleep schedule where you're waking up at like fifteen thirty like one and a half hour before the game and you're like She's oh, groggy. I have to take the shuttle. Right. Sure. Uh, it's outside we need to go now yes. and then they go and they play that first game and they're like oh shit and then they just fucking yes. grief it you know. Because in that first game like the mistakes they make I feel like Fnatic does have the firepower they're really good like individually. Yes. But they kind of lack the brain in the sense yes. of like how to actually snowball a lead. Because even in the first game that we watched, like versus Team Heretics, like, okay, despite them just running it down, and then they're randomly going to go and contest the Herald, even though they are behind the tempo, they don't, like, they can just give the Herald and be like, okay, with yes. the game. And it's still a fine game state. And that's the thing, like, okay, they lost first game, it was horrendous. But people make it out like, oh, Fnatic, they stomped the next two games and then they just took over Team Heretics. Like, no, did you watch that second game? Like, Fnatic were 5k up, they take a fight around Dragon, Jun is looking for a flank on the Aatrox, flashes to W, the Aatrox in, dies, when it's like so simple, they just have to be grouped in the river, let Jun look for a flank, and just play front to back, you're 5k up. But they're just lacking that, like, simple way of winning a game. And then afterwards, that fight, they lose it, they just sprint to Nash and do a 50-50, Yanko's in the pit, the Nash gets smited at 500, and then, even then, they all die, they lose three members after the Nasher. And then Team Heretics run into them and Noah gets a quadra kill. It's like, guys, it, it, it wasn't like Fnatic were stomping the second game. No, it was really close for no reason. And that's my problem with Fnatic. When I see them play, it's like they have so many easy games <coughs> where they can just snowball 
properly and they don't need to make any mistakes. Like it's so simple. And even in the like uh, Vitality series, if we jump forward, it's like Noah is like 2-0 on this Aya. And then they're like, okay, we dove bot and Noah is ahead right now. Okay, let's go topside. And then Noah gets dove on bot and he's like, what? Yes. And then later on, it's like Noah is on 5-0 <laughs> and he's on mid lane and he's like on mid. They're like, let's die bot. It's like they're trying to make it as hard as possible to win the game. And they see enemy and they fight. And th that's pretty much it. Let and me ask Noah you a question. Like 17 kills. I've got yeah. a question. One thing I've always tried to do is when I know pro players, this is one thing that's funny that everyone always tells me I know nothing. Yeah, the difference is in Counter-Strike, I'll tell you this, mate, I've watched every great game of Counter-Strike ever for 20 plus years and I knew every player. So I actually think, no joke, I, I think I know better than the pros sometimes. Now, I never say I know what they know. I know other things. I have a different perspective, maybe a bigger picture. But sometimes I will disagree. In league, I don't do that. What people don't know to this day is I go to some of the greatest players of all time, especially if they're still active in the other teams. And I ask them, like, what do you think of this theory on this? And if they shoot it down, they have good points. They'll go, ah, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe I need to rework that or whatever. And mm. sometimes if they make a really great point, they give me an insight. I'll, I'll use it on a show and I'll, I'll test it out. Like, does this make sense? So one concept I was taught years ago by some, because I've known some of the best shot callers, minds ever in European league. League. And they taught me some of the concepts, like when you split the map as a jungler, like when, like when you, when you shouldn't just like opt into an objective fight where you're behind and you can't win in the straight up five. In fact, they taught me the basic principles you should apply as a team, right? And one thing mm. they always told me is literally the solo queue principle as a jungler applies to this day, which is, you know, in solo queue, the problem is, let's say you're going bot lane because you're going to get a good 3v2 and you've pathed correctly and the other jungler isn't there. And that's just the best yeah. angle to go and get a kill. And you've got two other people to help you get a kill. There's a reason why bot lane became more ganked than Europe guys than top lane, right? What happens then classically is when your top lane gets ganked, Maybe it's like a cross map player, or he just gets ganked anyway. He doesn't look, look where the ward is. When he's down zero two, he obviously then you have to, he like perma pings you, doesn't it? Come, come top, come come. Because what he wants you to yeah. do is save him and save his lane, right? And the problem is in a solo queue game. People don't understand there's a concept, it's the same concept in medicine, it's called triage. It's where if a bunch of patients come in, you don't just start dealing with the kid who's cut his finger on a piece of paper, you deal with the guy who's died of a heart attack. You're going, right, that's way more important, I've got to put you to the one side. Yeah. And in fact, if I actually only have a certain amount of time, I'm never going to get to you, kid, with a paper cut. I'm sorry, I've got to deal with these guys like dying of like lungs, fucking, you know, bleeding out. And so basically, I was told a jungler, a good jungler, always has that in mind. And basically, if he does have lanes that are ahead and one is behind and is going more behind, Behind, nearly always, unless it's some like weird scaling comp, you have to do the opposite. You have to go, sorry, you're fucked. Actually, your job, by the way, top player in this analogy, is just die a bit less, but you're, you're going to be on your own, mate. I and I have to yeah. get that. If I've got bot lane 2 0 up, I've got to make them 4 0 up. You know, I've got to get them out of lane ahead. What would you say to this concept? Because I feel like it's another one of those ones where I know it's easy when you're not in the game to say, but the amount of pro teams that do what you say, they do like a democracy. It's like, right, you've had your get your head now, right? Yeah. Let's go fix it. It's like, why, why? Whoa, whoa, yeah. dude, in the LPL, they wouldn't do that. They would just go, like I say, if they have the Jace carry top later, that Jace mm. is going to either end the game like seven and nine, or he's going to be like 12 and two. You know what I mean? Like they're going to fucking push yeah. that lead. Give me your thoughts. You were, you were a jungler for a long time. Yeah, I mean, as a jungler, I got baited so many times in my entire pro league career where top laner would be like zero to me, but like, can, can you look top? And I have like a four zero bot lane and I'm like giving in not to it. And I'm like, oh, okay, just look. And then we both get killed. But it's like, you have to understand like this is their strong side of the map. Like this is the only play you can make where you have a losing chance. If you take a 3v3 on bot lane or 4v4, you will 90% win it because of how strong ahead your AD carry is. So it more becomes like top side versus bot side. But the way Fnatic plays, it looks like they want the whole map to be doing well. You know, everyone is doing good. Like no matter what, okay, no way's ahead, we can leave him. And that's the kind of mindset they have instead. Instead of like, no way's ahead, let's make sure we take every fight with him and let's make sure we continue snowballing because our chances yes. of winning every fight just goes up higher. It's just a mathematical equation where yes. it just makes more sense to play around the strong player and continue snowballing. And that's why also like a lot of... Uh, play, uh, t uh, a lot of people are hating on the LEC because they can't even execute this like basic thing where like playing around your strongest member and we saw it even in, like in the Giants X I don't want to talk about it but like you know when Patrick is like 5-0 but they're still playing on the other side it's like guys it's so simple like it's just one plus one it's it's two it's not like it's so simple just go play with him and uh, yeah I mean that's my issue with Fnatic because I feel like they're always going to give the opponents a chance to play the game even yes. though there shouldn't be any chance and uh, another like uh, situation I just want to talk about is like also how desynergized they are sometimes. Like Razork will look for a fight on bot, then Humanoid TP's top to shut down the Jace with his Rek'Sai top and Noah is already like 
really strong. It's just like, what are we actually doing? It looks like they're trying to play, play the entire map instead of just keeping it simple. Yes, and, uh, yeah, yeah. go on. I would also no, no, say, uh, yeah. uh, go on, finish off. <clears throat> okay, so uh, what I want to say, like, I don't think it's wrong to also take the fights when you are strong. Like, I don't want the, to be like the LCK back in like 2017. It's like, Too we only yeah, take sure. the 100% yes. play. Yes, true. Like, no, true. you should still play uh, like aggressive. You can win the fight. Yes. But if you have the option to just simply win the game and snowball it properly, then just take the option. Like, don't complicate the game. And yeah, that's, that's all I want to say. What that. I would say as well is the clue is in the analogy I gave guys of the medicine doctor, right? What essentially mm. his job there is, it's not, it's two parts. And this is the, part, the second part is what people miss, mate. He's not only identifying who he does need to deal with, he's saying no to the other person. And that's what I don't think happens, bro. That's why I actually hate, I won't do a whole political thing, but in teams, in league, I hate democracy, yeah. mate. Because democracy is like everyone gets an equal vote. Well, obviously the guy top lane isn't going to go I thought you don't you fuck my lane and let me look shit and everyone already hate me he's going to be like save me help me so in this analogy I have to say mm. that's why if I look at Fnatic one major concern I have I actually think this might be the whole problem with their team it's why I actually think that Trimby kick was kind of silly mate I think they yeah. lack shot calling I think they don't have the person to say no I think if people don't know like, Humanoid supposedly has a really good mind for the game and knows what he wants to do. But I've heard he's not the yeah. guy who's just talking all the time, like permanently telling everyone where to... And Razork, look, Razork knows how to play to the limits and his skill level is fucking amazing. And he does play like mm. he's a demon, but he clearly doesn't know when to stop and he doesn't know when to, when to not do that dive and doesn't know when to, like, pull back and play creative. And as we're saying, for the teamfight objectives... Like you mm. said, they do, this team doesn't know you can give up a fucking objective. They think you fight all the time, like like a bad LPL team. You know what I mean? Like you just go yeah. to the fight and opt into another fight. You go to the they essentially, if they were boxers, all they do is just stand in front of the other guy with no hands up, just fucking punch him like this and hope they knock him out while they're taking a load of blows themselves. It's like, listen, if yeah. you if you got the skill they have, you'll win sometimes. But notice how they're barely winning these series, guys. That's why I'm scared. If they even if even if they go to MSI, I'm scared because I feel like. Mm. You put them against any of the LPL teams, it's going to be so dangerous. They're going to get murdered. They're going to get absolutely murdered. Yeah. No, okay. I have to first say that I, I really love your analogies. I think that's one of your key skills. Like, you have really good analogies, <laughs> which are really fucking funny. But, yeah, that's, that's the thing. I, I think that a lot of teams struggle with this, where they have, like, too much Mr. Nice Guy. And what a Mr. Nice Guy is, is basically... You know, you say like, oh, you, you want to go here? Maybe we can fight. And then everyone's like, yeah, sure. Because Razor, to me, like when you listen to his comms and stuff, he's like very impulsive player. He's like, yes. he sees moments. And he's like, oh, maybe we can fight your guys. And everyone's like, yeah, sure. I mean, you look at that team, like who's going to say no? Oscarini, like that guy's a playing top lane. Like he has yeah. nothing to do there. And like you said, Humanoid is like really skilled, but he's not like the kind of guy that like talks. I'm sure he will say no. And he's the only guy saying no sometimes. But, uh, like, the Koreans are also not going to be the ones who are, like, overruling Razork when Razork is like, no, no, look, we can look at this. And then everyone's just like, oh, yeah, well, okay. And everyone just says, okay. But that's why you need that toxic piece of shit, like, sometimes in the team. Awesome. Who is like, no, you guys are fucking griefing. We're not doing this. Just stop it, you know? And they, like, calm them back down. And if they can get that kind of guy, I yes. think their games will look, like, so much better. Because they definitely yes. have the skill to execute every single, like, team fight and stuff. Because they are very mechanically skilled, like, the whole team. Yes. It's just they lack that discipline of just knowing which fights to actually take and then just okay you know what we are like a bit behind let's not give up two terrorists for this second rake and uh, that that's like the biggest weakness that i see with fanatic that's why and i gave are, oh, yeah. go on. no i was just gonna say like to lead on like if they are gonna play versus a team like bds or i guess g2 who are more composed in the fights that they take because the first time fanatic played versus g2 they just got dismantled it was like G2 was, didn't run into them and start inting. No, they took the fights that they want to take. They took the fights that they chose. And Fnaticus took the fights that they wasn't supposed to be able to take. And they didn't give them any opportunities to just roll back the game like Vitality does. And I, I just think they're going to get like rolled over. But any team versus G2 is going to get rolled over, honestly. Yeah, this is why I gave the example, because obviously they chose to remove this guy, uh, by the way, late in the off-season, apparently. That's why I said I would have kept Trimby, because as far as I know, he is a guy who's trying to call things, etc., and make calls. In, the game. in fact, in fact I, it was implied in past teams, because obviously he's good, that maybe like they, did, they thought they did that too much in past teams or whatever. In this team, it might work, mate, because the other angle would be, when you're, this is where, funnily enough, people get a bad rep as a player, but if you know what they're doing, it works. Well, when people like Crowley and Upset, you might think, ah, they get kicked out, how could they be good? It's the opposite. They're really good. 
good. Their problem is, though, they demand you only play their way. Like, they're like, everyone do what... Yeah. Now, here's the thing, though. If on the right team, that's fucking amazing. Like, you actually want... Uh, like, the joke is, I've even had... To, people like Upset know this is the rep. And so now, sometimes, when they're even in losing teams, they're sort of, well, I'll do that less because I don't want it to be that I was, like, the tyrant. In a way, mate, yeah. that's the best thing if you were just like, listen, fuck this. We don't know what we're doing. Group around me now. I've got two kills in the second item. And look, just do it. If we group now at this fight or we don't take this fight, that's where that guy actually being selfish sometimes can help you. The problem is then they do it through their style. So I'd rather it came from support if possible. I, I don't know why they did this John move. It's just weird. Yeah. It's a weird pickup for me. I'm not sure what it was. So I, I still think the saddest thing is if you could put a shot caller in this team, Mate, you clean up even a little bit of those lost games. This team would easily be the second best team. It'd be like them and G2 would be on the mountaintop and everyone else would be reaching up, doing yeah. nothing. Because I'm with you. If we now talk about BDS, this is why, if I actually get this right, by the way, I want everyone to actually give me, because I get so many things wrong in league shows. I've got to get fucking credit for this one. If BDS beats Fnatic, guys, you have to give me credit. Here's why. Because I actually think last split was a masterclass of coaching from BDS. Like, the mm. way they were able to pivot from crowny hypercarry, play through bot all the time, to Adam top lane is who we play through. He even was playing some meta champions, and then he worked in the ice guy, so he didn't even have the pressure on that split. Now you've had to go back this is what's mad. Yeah. This split, guys, they're going back to the opposite. It isn't crown shot there, though. The ice guy's having some pretty good games. Adam's actually having some bad games in Inton and showing some issues with his champion pool, potentially attitude-wise. Nuke and Sheo have just never been the same players they were last year. Like The lineup isn't even that good. Labrov's pretty good, but he was, you know, he can't be on a hook champion every game. They're not actually even yeah. as good as they were in winter, but the joke is they might actually be in finals. Like Because the key thing, I think, is what we were just mentioning. It's the composure. Like, this team somehow does know that they don't have to take fights. And when they're playing like a fanatic or one of these teams that like to play a bit, a bit crazy, they are, this is this is a sign of great coaching, by the way, guys. It's so hard to get like five players who think this way. They actually do let you into, into them. Bro, there are, there are so few teams in the West actually can do that. So if you, that is the Korean style of people don't know. That's what makes Koreans so difficult to play against. You think, well, just go for moves. That's exactly what they want. They're, they're yeah. waiting. They're, they're, they're about to fuck you up when you go in as the jungler on your own like that. Like they, You're going to find out like they saved an ult, like the fucking flashback out and then you're just in the middle of nowhere like that aspect of the team they haven't got much else going for them they're having a lot of trouble with a lot of other aspects even the draft you saw some of the shit against G2 but that one component mate that will win you a lot of League of Legends games if you can get to an objective and then just basically set up not go two balls deep yourself let the other person do the mistake and punish the mistake that fundamentally wins games like this seems like actually like I, I don't like the team at the moment but I've got to give them props for how they're playing yeah, no, for sure. I think BDS is probably the most composed team when we look at the, all the other teams, right? We look at like Vitality, we look at the Fnatic, like they are really crazy. But one of the reasons I think BDS will actually win versus Fnatic is just the composure that they have. They are going to choose the team fights that they do want to play. And they're not going to just run into Fnatic and get dragged into this like shit fest where everyone is just contesting everything and just continuing to, uh, yeah, it's just going to be complete chaos. But yeah, I think Fnatic, uh, like BDS definitely had the worst split overall like this year. And uh, ever since, like, the whole Adam incident, it doesn't look like uh, sort yeah, of the team has fully the recovered. Yeah. Yeah, but but it's really funny to me because it's like they replace Crown Shot for the reason of, like, we want to play topside. We don't want to play around ice. And then the, that's the thing about, like, Leo Legends Pro Play. It's always like, it, it doesn't matter what you think. Like, we can just change the entire patch in one week. And then you have to play, like, this way. And then, like, Jinx, Zeri comes it's in. All the like, same, okay, it's all the same. It's all the same champions for Crown Shot, isn't it? It's yeah. literally Crown It's like champions. so funny because all the champions that Crown Shot would play is actually yes. the ones that Ice is playing. But I have to say, like, Ice is performing really well. Yeah. Like, at least in Respect. the past series, like, Glob. he was almost able to carry some games, like, versus G2, despite them having, like, horrendous macro. But it, it's like. Ice is probably one of the like the key players in, yes. in the team right now. So he is like the guy that they're playing for again. And Adam is like the one that they're not playing for anymore. And they're just leaving him on this island and like kind of like hoping that he will carry the game or like hoping that he will do well in his lane. But everything, all eyes are on ice. And I think he's delivering, honestly. It's like, yeah, that's, that's why I think BDS will probably make the finals. Here's my question for you again, jungle question, yeah. which is I have found Chio one of the hardest players to evaluate the whole time he's been in LEC. Because I do think if you ever look, I always say this, like the term in English is like a bellwether. It's like a thing that shows like what's mm. coming, basically. I've always said, I think people over tunnel, obviously because of my beef with them as well, people tunnel too much individually on Nuke, like it's a 1v1 game. Like I've never yeah. seen him as some like god middling. He has like above average skills. He's like an all right player. He can, he can at times be like maybe the third or fourth best 
mid, but he's never like the crazy, he'll never take over the game like Caps. In fact, you even look at his champion pool, you can tell when he's mm. not in his game because they restrict it. They bring it down to like two or three champions and they just build all drafts out of those two or three champions and they never put him on once he's uncomfortable on. Because by the way, the odd times he gets on an uncomfortable champion, it can look really fucking bad. Like he can really have bad games. So for me, I've always thought Shio's form is what I'm looking for. When Shio's forms up, that's when I feel like Nuke comes up with him and they actually, they're able to do stuff. How do you evaluate this Shio player? Because I, I feel like no one ever says he's uh, one of the best junglers, but he's been on teams that have been near the top. And like I say, he seems yeah. to have some up and down for Who is his year as a jungler to you? I mean, to me, he's a very creative jungler. At least like last year was when I was the most surprised, even like back in LFL uh, playing all right. Him. I think he's like, they, they used to do all these like level one invades. Like, I, I don't know if you remember, but there was like this infamous where he played Wukong, he jumps over the wall and stands yes. behind the enemy. Like when they start red buff and then he just steals it, you know, like he has that kind of creativity, but it kind of got like toned down uh, more towards this year. And you haven't seen that kind of Shio, like, again, I haven't seen those level one strategies or anything like this. I feel like Shio's job right now as a jungler is more to be like the savior of the team. So like a lot of times when Adam like maybe messes up his lane or something, the Shea will drop all these camps and he will go top and for a creative gangs. Like he has very creative pathings and, and he will find opportunities that most junglers are not going to find. Like most junglers just want to finish their full clear, but he's going to do like two camps even, and then he's just going to run into mid and then look for a gank because he knows it's going to be helpful for a nuke. And when he's doing these kind of things, then he's kind of like salvaging every single lane. And uh, I think Shea has been like, he hasn't really been able to play his own game. He's got a hard he's job, hasn't he? Like, getting ran around and yes. having to help laners and he prioritized that and that's yes. why he's like so essential for uh, bds as well yes. so for me he's not a superstar jungler in the terms that he will like play graves and fucking uh, get like 200 cs up and be like milky way and his 1v9 no he, he's more like the salvager of the team and he will like he will give up himself to help the team get ahead and sometimes he can backfire and he chaos fall behind and be completely useless but most of the times he's actually doing the right things in game and I think it comes from having a good coaching staff as well and just having a set way of playing the game that BDS all understand. This is where, though, I have to give Adam a bit of flame. Not only is he just not looked as good. I mean, I'll even say this. The reason why I think his form isn't that good, even on his champion, sometimes he's not actually winning. Like, there used to be almost auto wins when he locked those in. He always would have the edge. By the way, guys, you've Adam, thank you. You know what your service, you have you have done an admirable service for EU. You've taught everyone how to play against Olaf and fucking Darius and Garen, mate. That's why Garen isn't even a champion anymore. Like, thank you. Before that, we would have gotten fucked up if like Gam or someone had come with some crazy top lip. We never will now, because you've trained everyone in scrims and official games what to do. Finally, guess what? That Olaf doesn't just run over the whole team fight. It's not impossible to kill. Nowadays, people don't let you kill them 1v1. They didn't know they'd kill threat before because they weren't specialists in these weird matchups. That seems to have gone, especially when his individual forms down a bit. And my biggest problem is this. If you are Shio, Adam is now your biggest nightmare. Because this guy, I, if, I don't know if you remember, there's a classic gif everyone's seen on the internet, I think, right? It's one where there's a guy and he's helping this baby deer, you know, the animal, a deer that comes in the forest. Yeah. He's helping this baby deer out of a swimming pool. You might have seen this one. And the second he gets it out, because it's a deer and it's just like an animal, <laughs> the second he gets it out, it just runs and then it fucking falls back in the pool and you're like, oh, but yeah. you know, that's what Adam is sometimes like. If I'm Shio in that scenario, it's like, again... Because remember, Adam also isn't like a guy, the rookie. He's also 22 now, guys. He's not 19 anymore. He's 22 years old. He's been in the league a long time. He clearly has a very strong perspective. And he's on that super shit. He does think he's the best as well. He like, guys, I actually thinks he's cracked and he thinks he should be played through. I'd imagine that guy is asking you for fucking gags. By the way, they're also French. Like, I'm pretty sure he is telling him, like, come, come now, I can get him with the kill now. Like, but the problem is, I have to say, if I was Shio or I'm the coach of BDS, coach of BDS, I would tell Adam, you literally are on an island, bro. Do your shit in those 1v1 ones try not to die too much but yeah you know pressure if you want draw the if, listen draw the enemy jungle all day long if you want man see if you can get out the gank but we're not mm -hmm. fucking sending she or top because the problem i have with that is it's like you say another nightmare if you're a jungler is i can't be in three places at one time and worst thing is in the modern day the second they spot me in one lane they can make a cross map play so even if i come and try to fix your lane maybe now our advantage gets destroyed bot lane or maybe they do the gank mm -hmm. on nuke the second i show on that river ward like oh fuck and then they go in on him or tp in on him like i feel like the problem Problem is Adam when he's on his game provides like a weird sort of like a last split he was the main carry but in the last years yeah, yeah. if you think when they had Crowdy he was more like sort of like a, a weird insurance policy it's like what you said about Photon it's like you're playing through bot but he might fuck around sometimes Adam and have a game on his champs where he can win you the game too he can yeah. he can do some moves now I feel like he's a little bit of a liability.
Yeah, I mean, he's definitely not the same as he was, at least last split. I, I don't know if it's affected because of the whole bench situation. But I think about Adam as well is that you kind of have to play around him. And the thing is, like, you if you want to do, like, you say, like, okay, let's drop him, Sheo, just go bot, then Adam, it will actually just keep running it until you actually lose the game. So it's like, kind of like when Adam gets ahead and you do get him ahead, then he looks really good and he will actually look to carry you games, a lot of the games. But that's the thing, it's just how he plays the game. It's a very like aggressive way of seeing the laning phase. Like he wants to push his advantages every single time. And that will backfire a lot of times as well, especially when oh, now sure. that Ice is the carry. And I think he's had a very hard time accepting that kind of role where yes. he has to lie back and be yep. kind of like just waiting for Ice to actually carry the game. Or, okay, team is just playing for Drake. I will just lay back. And he doesn't really know how to do that yet. And uh, yeah, I think that's why also it looks... Like, Shiyu has to go top, because if he doesn't, then it might just become, like, instead of just a little match being flamed, like, the whole house will burn down if you don't go there. Like, you have to go there. And uh, Shiyu's in a difficult position where he has to choose between, do, is it worth it? If I go top here, will my bot lose too much? Will we lose Dragon? So hopefully he, like, takes on Dragon, and then he <coughs> looks to help Adam. Uh, especially if he's gonna... I think also that's why they stopped playing this, like, Olaf and Darius, because I thought, like... When G2 blinded the Scion, even though he was the lane swap thing, he didn't go into the Darius, which I thought like he would always do into Darius. Yep. I mean, it is a bit worse this meta because of the like Zeri and these kind of champs, but it was banned. So I, I, it just seems to me like in scrims that they've been practicing like Adam more on weak side, we're going to play harder for bot side and he's practicing that kind of style, which is a new style for him where he has to kind of like lay back and just let his team carry, kind of like the old one style. Uh, of how they used to play, which is a hard skill to teach. I think it's one of the hardest skills to teach as a top laner to understand when you can play aggressive. Like, oh, if I walk up here, I can bait enemy jungler and waste his time. So he's going to be top. So our bot lane can get an advantage. Yes. And that's a, that comes with a lot of experience and understanding. I think Odawane and Wunder are like the two top uh, like top laners to understand this kind of like mind games of yes. wasting enemy jungler's time and etc. And he doesn't just have that experience just yet. He just knows how to like roll over a lane and then snowball from that and call his jungler. So he doesn't think about that like bigger picture. Uh, what about this right. then? There was one last thing on BDS I want to ask, which was this. I'm not going to go hard on the new quantum. It's not his bad. He just had some sort of whatever games. They were just a bit meh. Mate, if you're going to pick Azir every single game, here's the problem. When they first reworked the Azir, everyone was going, well, you know, it's not the same champion. It's not as strong. Guys, I'm watching these LTL, LCK and LPL games where the Azir are fucking dominating these games. Like, they do, they can do everything. You can be behind and they get the shuffle off in mid, get one guy into the tower, bring the carry away from their fucking peel. It, it, these Azirs can win or lose you the game massively mm. in the East. When I watch Nuka play every game against G2, too. It's like we're never going to get that. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I don't know what's happened to his game. What do you? Where's this guy at? Uh, I mean, I think first of all, like the meta changes, right? And that's like a big uh, factor as well on the gameplay. But I think he's also not had like the best spring split uh, like he had last year. I think he was one of the main carries in last yep. year. Like his performances were insane. Like he, I remember playing like Syndra and stuff like this. Yes. He almost brought them to worlds, and he got like the credit for that. I think as this uh, meta is more about like Azir and then bot lane has become so impactful in the way that you're not really playing around mid. But one thing to also keep in mind is like when you're playing against G2, they're not going to give you those like random fights where Nuke is going to get like super fed or run into him. But I actually think I have a prediction. I think he's going to have like a really good series versus Fnatic just because of how they play. I think he's just yeah. going to get like randomly fed and he's just going to look like you know, peak performance again. Right. And that's just my prediction. But I think yeah. versus G2, like, if you remember the game, like, he runs top lane to cover the dive and then dies. And then runs top lane again to cover the dive and then dies. It's like, they, they were just brain gapped by G2 completely. And I think it's really hard to actually look good when you can't do anything versus them, especially if they're just smarter around the map and they're, they know how to play the game and they choose which fights you are going to take. Yes. But uh, yeah, it was a very, like, he was kind of invisible in that series, but I think the whole team was just invisible because they were just getting out-rotated the entire game. He's also another player, in my opinion, that the coaching staff is just very, very shrewd in reading what his... Whatever they say in interviews, I don't care, because in interviews you pump people up. Privately, I can tell they know his strengths and weaknesses, and that's one of the other reasons why they sort of, like somewhat band-aid his champion pool when they have to because this guy is the guy who's the defining factor of like I sort of need to play a little bit chill if you come into me then I can get like I'll, get, I'll take what you give me basically in this scenario because actually if you remember earlier in the upper bracket of the playoffs he had that absolutely abomination Syndra game mate where he tried doing shit like roam bot and then it do all mm. his combo and then he would it, you could tell it was almost like 
what the fuck? He's not dead. And it's like, bro, bro, you don't, you don't even know how much damage that does. Like, holy shit. Like you can't make aggressive plays if you don't know these things. Like you've got to actually, you've got to have like a sense for those. Like, as an aggressive player, he just doesn't check out for me. He's not a bad player, mm. but you know, here's the problem. I always want the guy who's like a stud. I want the guy, like I, I might, I might hate on Humanoid for his int games, but it is yeah. peak. It's fucking sick, isn't it? Like you're watching him play on the edge of his mechanics. He will kill everyone. Yeah, yeah. No, when Humanoid's at his peak as well, then he looks like he can contest caps. Like, he's one of the few players in EU that can actually do it. But when Nuke was playing well, like, last year, it, to me, it looked more like the whole team was just playing really well. Right. Like, they were all on the same page, and Nuke was bringing, like, uh, everyone was giving him the resources that he needs to play aggressive, and then Nuke can actually pop off. Like, he had some insane, like, Tristana games last year as well, yep. and stuff like that, where he really looks like he's on form. So I think he's just kind of the player that's like, if his team is doing well, then he will do well. If his team is doing worse and they have no idea how to, what to do in game, then he just looks worse as well. Cause he has to take the role probably of like actually leading the team and calling what to, where to go, et cetera. And I just think he needs to be in a, in a state where his team knows what he's doing and he's able to just focus on his lane and then has his, and also the meta has to be like good for him as well. Cause I think this meta is not like that nice. I mean, there's Azir and now our soul comes in as well. And it's like new matchups, et cetera. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure where to put like Nuke uh, as a player. I thought they had a really good last year. This year is not as impressive. Uh, but uh, we'll see like during the playoffs if he's actually going to come back to a decent form. But it's heavily reliant on Shio as well, uh, doing well. If the narrative around G2 already was, like, essentially hand them the trophy, no one could beat them, they win every scrim, you know, if you notice nowadays, people, it's hard to even actually call them out if they had a bad game or they did a stupid draft because it just feels like they're just experimenting in scrims, but those are stage yeah. games now, if you know what I mean. But all, here's what I will say that tells me I don't think anyone else believes they can actually beat G2, was that fucking BDS lane swap that is the big drama. I'm not going to get into the drama on whether or not it was leaked. Yeah, yeah. Here's the reason why that is a terrible sign for the LEC. Because, guys, if you actually go and look at where the BDS players had to go, let's say, let's say it wasn't known and they were just gambling that this was the right call based on what they initially saw, that this was the counter to the invade, right? The gamble positions they took, this is where fans will never understand. You have to be able to imagine this is where ProView would be so sick. You have to be able to imagine it without the fog of war of the rest of it, right? You can only see what they can see. The gambles they took, look, they actually lost this game anyway, but they were working early. But that only works if G2 does exactly that. If G2 doesn't, you have taken such a crazy gamble with your starting positions on the map. You might have just put yourself completely behind in the game. Like, you could essentially, not like straight lose the game, but you put yourself in a really bad spot taking up those positions. So, like, if you're going to do that in a game against them in the playoffs, that almost suggests to me that you don't think you can beat them playing normal League of Legends. You can't just do a normal draft, a normal lane phase, get ahead in one lane. Like, but you don't think you can do that. You think you have to do crazy gambles because that, that's something you do in a BO. One game. They did that in a playoff game. It worked, but I was thinking to myself the whole time, dude, what if you what if you've guessed wrong? What if like mm. what if that's just a jungler and someone's going, you know what I mean? Like that, what did you think? You're a jungler, you know what those setups are like. Uh, they're, they're weird, right? I mean, the thing is it's it's kind of funny because I used to play in the lane swap meta back then, and it was that's the kind of thing about lane swaps in general. It's a lot of mind games of knowing like, oh, they're gonna swap this game, so they're gonna go top, but they know that we are also gonna go top and right. match them, so we actually go bot. And it's kind of like, you have to kind of play those kind of right. mind games. So I think like the gamble they took, I think it's it's not relatively that big of a risk. It is a risk if they actually do go bot, but I think it's relatively safe to assume that they will actually look to a swap because they have like a losing top, losing bottling, hard losing bottling, and enemy team has a volibear. So it's like worst case, okay, you do mismatch, but then you just have to run bot, I guess, and you will lose some CS, but you will at least be able to play the game normally. But uh, I just think like lane swaps are super fun to uh, watch. Oh, like sure. I don't want to go full in on the drama about like. No, no, don't worry about that. But I just want to say something about like how refreshing it is to see G2 just do like a lane swap and stuff like this. Because for years now, I've been watching like LEC, and it's always like. Oh, we're LCK, okay, they play like this and they do this, okay, we copy, and we're just worse version of like LPL and LCK. Like, we're always going to be, just be worse trying to beat them at their own game. So it's just really refreshing to me to see like G2, even this split, like being the first to pull out the Rek'Sai top, being the first to pull out the Zac top, I think. I'm not sure if it was the first first, but they're like willing to innovate, they're willing yeah, yeah. to change and be creative. Like, we're not going to have this like... Oh, let's just uh, keep doing what the LCK is doing. Oh, they played the Shovi played the Real Soul. I think it's good now, and we just copy, 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 copy. Like we're never gonna win like that. So, I was just really happy to see like the lane swap and actually making the game uh, like somewhat interesting. Because if we can't beat the Koreans two v two, let's just not lane versus them and let's do a lane swap. And it's just perfect to me. I, I think it's 
might actually be like if we can perfect this kind of lane swap or other strategies might actually have a chance we might ca catch some teams off guard like do a lane swap but they're not ready for it because teams who at least back then as well like teams who actually know how to play lane swaps they just had the edge like uh, giants in 2016 they only lane swapped every single game and they were top two in the yes. regular season and then they removed the lane swap in playoffs and they became the bottom tier team so it's like if you're able to actually do the lane swap properly and you're able to play these kind of mind games it's super super fun to watch at least when you understand it but can be boring as a viewer for sure no no so if people i, I really yeah, love well, that series no, no i just want to say i really love that series if like, people overall. don't know the history as you said riot were literally the ones who disabled lane swap they made like the fucking tower yeah. take them on the top one and then they eventually went to a plate so obviously that philosophy has continued on but the mm -hmm. other thing is what people forget always is this Europe were the ones who mastered that shit first. And then literally even Koreans had to come and look at the gear at the fucking uh, VODs and start figuring it out themselves. They weren't doing that shit actually. When Europe did it every game, Korea didn't. And so I agree with you, especially because G2 is the one that's like well, willing to do it. Well, G2 already has the best draft and probably the most champions available because of their players. Yeah. But like they're fantastically GM team. This is actually the one where I agree with you. I could see Dylan Falco at least having a game, which otherwise he might have had like a hard time in the draft against the like you think of like a BLG you're going to have a hard time drifting a winning comp against them I tell you what if you do some crazy lane swap and you gamble and pays off now there's suddenly a game that they're not prepared for they don't, they don't know what it's like to be in this weird scenario like well I thought we had the winning lane there I thought this match we planned out yes. the jungler to come at this point that could give you a game that could get you a game in a series no but that's the thing also that's very underrated when it comes to League of Legends like pro play making the enemy team react to you and play your own game like making them play your game they're always going to lose at that like if you're able to force the enemy team to play your game like you're always going to have the advantage because you have more experience on it you have more like knowledge about the lane swaps or even forget the lane swaps like whatever you do in League of Legends if you're able to force the enemy team to react to you and this is one way to actually do it is always by swapping I mean even if you're swapping your bot lane into top, et cetera, like just forcing the enemy team to react to you, you're always going to have the edge uh, when it comes to playing. So I, I'm just really happy to see that we're getting creative. We're trying some stuff. And the G2 obviously is the only team, like I, I would be shit scared if I was drafting versus G2 now. Like let's say Dylan Falke has a bad day. He does a terrible draft. It's like, oh, well, it's fine. Let's just lane swap. It's like, what, what do you expect about sure. these guys now? Like now sure. that they've shown it too, like how do you beat these guys? It's impossible. It's like, even if you like mindlessly like try to outdraft Dylan Falco, and that's pretty impossible with G2's champion pool. But let's say you manage to do it, they can just lane swap out of nowhere, yes. and now you have to like go into a game. And how are you gonna practice lane swaps? You barely can do the basics in scrims, so you're constantly like practicing like the most basic shit in the in scrims. Like, oh, we need to learn how to set up dragon. It's like you don't have time to practice lane swaps. Like, you can't even uh, you can't even crawl, and you're trying to walk. So it's just. Um, yeah, I, I just think G2 are going to roll over anyone in the finals and there's just no contest in, in that sense. It's why I also think the other teams have to fix the roster first and foremost, like how you play. Because Dylan Falco already was, I was if all the players say this in my interviews, they say he's the best at baiting the pick. As in, he purposely leaves that pick open. That is one of your best picks and is what you build your comp around. But because when you pick it, he's got like four different counters built out from that. And then even though you end up getting a couple of your picks, he, he ends up yeah. with the better comp or the one that counters that or doesn't allow that champion to do what it wants to do. He's already good at that. And then because he has because he's got all the best players almost. He's got the lonely champion ocean to pick from. So his, yeah. his solutions to what you're going to do are all over the place. Meanwhile, think of some of the teams we were talking about earlier. Most of the other teams, we're talking about actually being pretty cynical drafting if you're a BDS, if you're Fnatic probably even. Some of these squads out there, you can't just pick any champion in the game and you can't just switch comp halfway into the draft. Either. You've got to sort of see it through. That's what you practiced. There, That's another yeah. thing about having inexperienced players. You can't just throw them in a game with champions they've never played before and go just win against G2, they're not going to do it. Like, like they, there was always going to be that edge for G2. Yeah, no, for sure. I just think that's why also no one, no team will ever be able to contest G2 with the current rosters that we have. Like, I think Vitality could, if they just make that little tweak, I think Vitality could actually be a top contender. Like, they have the strong enough individual skill, but they just lack that like explosiveness from a jungle per se. Not to flame Douglas. Uh, no, but, no. Yeah, but it's just like if we just tweak the rosters a little bit and make them like more more complementary uh, towards each other, then I think we could actually have, instead of just having like, I don't know, top, like eight dysfunctional teams, we would actually just have like clear top four, top five uh, like teams that would actually look to, we would be happy to send them to Worlds. We'd be like, these guys are our best and they can like do really good. But instead every team we send to Worlds like, 
yeah, these guys are good, but they have clear weaknesses. But it's like, yeah, I think if we can just fix that, uh, then the EU future might actually look good. And we stop giving rookies like eight years of playtime to see when they will develop. Then I think uh, we might have a chance. And then the last factor, because it's an obvious one, but you have, if you're going to go week to week on a show like this, guys, we have to wax lyrical about who does well. The one other chance you at least had in some of the past splits, or last year especially, was there'd be times when Caps would just have an all right series or he'd just pick a better champion and not go hard. Mate, it feels like now, <laughs> like he can just do whatever he wants. Like, he goes fucking... Su this is like old Caps. He just goes super hard many times he wants. It fucking works, mate. He's, just, he's still good. No, he, he looks like old peak form caps or he's peaking right now. Like, I have no idea. But there used to be the meme of like, oh, craps. Like, he used to play really bad and he was really inconsistent like back then. But now he just looks like on form. Like, there's just nothing that can beat him. He beats everyone in lane. He completely carries every single team fight. And he also, like, the thing I saw when he was like playing versus BDS as well is like, he goes top and dives a uh, humanoid. Then he runs straight bot, and then he just kills the enemy bot lane as well. And he's just all over the place on his Aurelian Soul. And it's like, holy fuck. Like, I'm so glad we have caps. Like, any team with yes. caps, is just, it's just automatically going to become the top one team. Like, except the Reckless and caps, uh, the G2 split. Besides them, that guy has gone to the finals every single time. Like, yes. he's by far, like, the GOAT, I would say. Yeah. Like, this region is run by caps. Right and, it, and obviously, as much as we praised all the other aspects of G2 and the draft, he's also a yeah. massive chance to win. Listen, again, you're not going to like just straight up win a best of five. Like if you actually play against like BLG, you're playing against Knight or you play against, I don't know, it could be top esports yet. Cream's pretty yeah. good. Like but the difference is he actually is capable. He can give you at least a game. He can have a game. He takes over and gets ahead and has the right pick. You get some picks for him. Like that's another thing. Yeah. If you're a European fan or a Western fan, this guy gives you a reason to at least watch these games. Yeah, for sure. Uh, like, if I see Caps versus Knight or Caps versus Faker or whatever, I'd be, I'd be like, okay, there is a chance, you know? But if you see, like, I don't know, okay, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not Certain other mid laners, but, let's uh, just say. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, but let's just say another mid laner, you'd be like, oh, shit, man. You know, like, yes. Rios eventually going to get run Close. over. But when you see, like, Caps, you're like, okay, I mean, this guy will be able to contest, at least go, like, 50 50, or he might even win the lane. Like, so, uh, yeah, that's, like, the hope that we have, like, the shining light of our region is legit Caps. Right, and like just fun to watch. Like yeah. true jungle mains, when you're sick of it all and it's basically over, you just quit. 